I want a one-hour sermon. I want it. I want I want to preach on this forever. I'll be kind. I'll let you get home eventually. But this is so good. This topic for me is like one of the most exciting like keys to what Christ has for us. This topic relates to all of us whenever we feel disconnected or disenfranchised with church as a whole. So that's everybody at some point or another, myself included. This topic relates to all those people who are longing for close Christian friends. Where is that person that just, ah, it's like a soulmate to me. This relates to all those who are trying to make an impact in this world, actually see something get done for the Lord. How are we going to actually see anything happen? What's it look like? How do we go about it? And this is for all those who think they're just fine on their own. I'm good. I don't need more friends. Do you know that there was a family that came to this church once, and that was the first thing they said to me? We really love New Hope. We really love your teaching. I mean, we don't need any more friends. We're not looking for friends, but we just really like being a part of this church. You think they're still here? Nope. Nope. Last week we talked about the why. Why community? Why people together? Why body of Christ? Why church? This week is how. All right, good. So we got our theory behind us. We, we laid out a theology of community. And if you didn't get a chance to visit with us last week, check it out on YouTube. Please learn and think these scriptures with me. These are important for us as a church. And what are two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, so maybe 15, 30, 45 of us here? Jesus only needed 12 to change the world. It's plenty more than enough in this room to see God's kingdom come with power. Right? We got double, triple what Jesus used. So what we actually want to do is kind of reset a little bit and say, what did Jesus use? Jesus had relationships. What did they look like? What kinds of relationships did he, had? did he have? If we follow his model, we will be blessed. If we follow his teachings, we will be blessed. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Do what he does. Think what he thinks. Say what he says, pray what he prays. That's it. Get in line, follow the leader. Jesus is first. That's our whole life, and it's powerful when we do it. But sometimes we have expectations. You know, we, we want something, but then we're not experiencing it. I want to feel like a part of the church, but I don't know enough people, and I really am kind of shy, so I don't want to connect with others, but I know that I should, but maybe I don't want to. But like we talked about this last week a little community, it can be tricky. And there are some who want all in and some who want all out, but what does Jesus call us to? That should be our starting point. Funny thing about it is that Jesus doesn't call us to just one level of community. His own relational circles had a 1, a 3, a 12, and a 70. Different relational circles. And he invested himself in those in different ways. And so essentially all I want to do is just look at how Jesus lived with his brothers and sisters in Christ, and say, you know what, church, let's just do that. Let's just be the band of disciples with Jesus leading us, as there is a lot of power in that. So if I could ever refer a book, it would be probably this one. This is called The Master Plan of Evangelism. It's kind of a classic, a Christian classic, written by a man named Robert Coleman. Had the privilege of being a student of his in seminary, and he was teaching a class on discipleship. And guess how he organized his classes? Him as the teacher... 12 students per class. Guess what we did? We prayed together. We talked about Jesus' words together. And when we prayed, we knelt on the floor. It was in a house. It wasn't in a classroom. When I heard this guy pray, it made me choke up. And he wasn't showing off. He just loves Jesus. It made an impression on me. This is a man that you can trust when he writes. He's speaking from the heart. He's not self-promoting. He's just a wise, wise person. And the master plan of Jesus, how he's going to change the entire world, starts with one, goes to three, goes to 12, goes to 70, and God takes it from there. It's exactly God's model. It's exactly what Jesus came and incarnated for us. And I think there's wisdom in every level of that. And I would just like us to look at it and see how it applies to us. 
Because we may be good at the 70, like the whole large church, but do we have a three? You got close friends? Soul mates? Do you have 12, a group of friends that you are on mission with, that you're doing ministry with, that you live life together with? Is Jesus your one? Does it go in this order? Maybe we come to church first, so it starts with 70. Jesus didn't start that way. He started with his most personal acquaintances, his most intimate disciples. And from there, he expanded. He said, what can we do? What could the four or five of us do for the Father? And so they just started doing. And then the 12, the disciples. And at one point, we're going to see Jesus sends out 70. And they healed. They did miracles. They taught. They did all the things that he did. He just sent them out. Go, do what I'm doing. But do it together. So sometimes we hope that being a part of a church like Sunday morning kind of style 70, is going to give us the friendship of a three. That's not going to happen here. But it could happen with these exact same people. And this 70 is a powerful thing. We all get together. Serve Home is going to be the most beautiful example of the 70. It's actually more than 70. It's 86, I think, people serving right now. When we have 86 of God's people go and thousands of dollars raised and we just spend time serving, that's a huge impact for the kingdom. But we still need every morning and every night, to be us and Jesus. And if no one else is around us and no one else is with us, we've got him and he's got us. We need our three. Because it can be really smiley and all Sunday best from 10.30 to noon and, and then alone, Monday through Saturday. I'll tell you a story. I need to try to make all my thoughts succinct today just for sake of time. Here's the pendulum that I want us to describe, and we'll just look at a couple of scriptures. The point, I think, even is already being made now. We don't need to read every scripture on it. Note to self, read every scripture. Right, okay, got that. I love doing that, by the way. Reading every scripture in the Bible that could possibly, that's not helpful. So here's the pendulum. I was in college, and um, one of my acquaintance friends, not close friends, um, spoke in chapel. So the college was about, I think, only... A little less than 3,000 people, right? It's not a huge university. It's a small Christian school down in Pennsylvania. He stood up in chapel, and as a brave act, a courageous act of vulnerability as part of his testimony, he shared with the entire student body the problems he was having with lust and pornography. Like That is a brave, bold move. And it just kind of like blew up on him. He didn't have close relationships with these people. It invited whispers and gossip. It invited opinion and critique. He shared what should have been a three conversation with the 70. Now, it's funny because probably 95% of the people in that auditorium, myself included, were struggling with exactly the same things that he talked about, but it wasn't safe. And those people were not for him. And so I don't know that it was the right or the wrong thing to do, but it just strikes me Do we have people that we can share safely with that have a heart that support us? You know, he finished out that year. He didn't come back the next year. The whispers around what he had just shared honestly were like more than his relational meter could hold. I'm sure, and I pray he's still serving the Lord, a great godly guy. He was just being honest, but he took a three conversation and he put it in 70, and it could have gone well, but just didn't. So shame on all the people that didn't handle it well. But like, what do you say? (laughs) And then do you never talk about that bombshell that's been you know, thrown out? Like, it's just hard to know, and I don't think we all handle it as well as we could have as a school. And so pray that God's blessing him. There's some times where something's built for a three. But let's say I turn to Jane and say, Jane, I have a job for you. If you could do it the next couple of weeks, it'd be great. I would like you to share the gospel with every man, woman, and child just in Easton alone. All right, so don't worry. It's not Brockton and Taunton, just Easton. You look at me and you say, it's impossible. How do you get to those people? What are their work schedules? What, if you knock on the door, are they going to open it? Do they know you? Will they, uh, I'm asking for something that's custom built for a 70 of a 1. You can start there, but you're going to need help. <laughs> it needs to grow. The kingdom grows. You plant a seed and it grows. Right? If I turn to you, Conrad, and say, I'd like you to go ahead and feed all the homeless in Brockton. Just get on that, brother. I know you can do it. You kind of can because you can invest yourself and God can multiply loaves and fishes, but it's like asking something of a one or a three that's custom built for the body of Christ. So I'm just saying, think about what Jesus did in these groups. Think about if we are investing in these groups, and most importantly, ask yourself, do you have each of these? 
Do you have a 3? Do you have a 12? And do you have a 70? I'm going to refer to scriptures. I'm not going to have us turn. You know these words. You know these words. You know God's word. We've read these. We preached the entire life of Jesus. This comes straight from that. You know this. Who were the first disciples that Jesus called? Peter, James, and John. Andrew was there as well. Fishermen. When you see it in Matthew, all it says is Jesus went up to the boat and met Peter, James, John, Matthew, or Andrew, and said, come follow me, and he did. But you know what? When you read the other two Gospels, Luke, John, you see that a week or two before, sometime before, Andrew and John had been disciples of John the Baptist, and they saw Jesus in the distance, and they said, who's that? And he said, he's the one to follow. So they left John the Baptist to pursue Jesus. Oh, Jesus is the one. They were pursuing Jesus. They came after him before he ever called them. And you know what Luke says? It says that actually Jesus was in Simon, his home, and his mother was sick. And Jesus healed his mother. Jesus was in their lives. They were pursuing and seeking, and he met their practical needs. He didn't just show up out of the blue and say, hey, you, let's go. He was in their world, and they responded to him. They were looking. He was calling, and they came. Those four, and then Andrew is mentioned lesser and lesser over time. So really, Peter, James, and John are the closest to Jesus, his entire ministry. Your three need to be the people that have like been there and done that with you. They've been with you. They've been with you. They've seen the healings over time. They've learned the lessons with you. They've been for you. We have to be together. Those are the three. Those are the three we need to be able to trust. The ones we grow together, we make mistakes together with, we reconcile with, we expand with, we learn with, we change. Like the three. You know, those three were the ones that Jesus took aside further in the Garden of Gethsemane when it was time to pray. He's like, I need you close. We all, myself included, need our three and we need to hold them close. Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus is going up to experience glory, to be transformed into his resurrected body. And to meet with Moses and Elijah, he brings three along. Peter, James, John, they're just his three. And if we don't have a three, we're going to feel like a nameless face in the 70. I've been a part of a bunch of small groups over the years, blessed to, I love them, where you're in 12. And then you're in the 12, and you're in the 12, and you're serving, and it feels like it's getting close, and you're knowing each other. And then a couple months down the line, you realize, oh, wow, this marriage was falling apart the entire time that we were together, but it didn't get there. We never got there. It felt safe, but it was still 12. We need the three, and we need to open ourselves up to our three and listen and let others open ourselves up to three. If we don't have the three, the 70 feels lonely, and the 12 feels like hypocritical. Like we say we're together, but it doesn't feel together. It's okay. Jesus knows this. His model is for you to have a three. Find your three. But it wasn't just the three. It went on. Then he picked all these disciples. He chose them. He called them. Remember how he called Matthew or Levi? He was walking along and he saw this sinful guy collecting taxes, extorting money. He says, you prime candidate, come with me. And he goes and has a meal in his house. A couple of weeks from now, we're going to talk about hospitality and food and faith and how they come together. So keep that thought in mind. The key words in that is, as he was on his way, Jesus saw Levi. There's going to be some of your 12 that you're just going to bump into along the way. These are your neighbors who move in. You just bump into them along the way. These are coworkers. These are just people that visit the church once or a friend of a friend. Like just The 12 can come from anywhere. But the 12 has to build on the three. And all of them were following Jesus. It was just the one. Right? Jesus said, come and follow me. So these three people... Follow Jesus. So if you have a three, who are you following? Just Jesus. It's you three and Jesus. And if there's 12 together, what's the point? What did he do with disciples? He pulled them aside and he explained things in more depth than he did to the crowds. That's what the 12 did. He said, to the crowds I talk in parables, but to you I want you to know what this means. That's when we as a small group get together and open the Bible and say, what exactly does this mean for me? On a Sunday morning here in the 70s, it's more sort of like, here's a word of truth. And then kind of like figure out what it means for you. But in the 12, you're actually like hashing it out. Working out your salvation with fear and trembling together as brothers. What does this mean? Well, here's my circumstance. Here's this situation. Here's my question. Here's my fear. Here's my baggage. You know, real people doing this together. But it's still always following the one. The 12, he sent them out. They taught. They did miracles. The healings. Everything. They baptized. Right? So they did all the stuff he did. They just went out and did it. That should be us. That should be our three, going out and healing people, going out and praying for people, going out and teaching the word, going out and 
proclaiming the good news that God loves this awful, crazy world that he made and that he's going to redeem. Right? So it's the same with the three. It's the same with the 12. The 70 is going out and proclaiming Jesus. That's our mission as a church. We're going to um, serve in Brockton, serve home, not to get credit. We sang a song this morning that one of our own wrote, but we don't want to take the glory because if we take the glory, we rob God of the glory and no fruit will come from that. It just becomes like popularity contest, not the gospel. The gospel is we're all equal. God loves us. So my question for each of us is just, where are we at, church? Where are we at? Over in different times and for different people, I've seen us excel at all of these areas. I love this church body. I love this group that God has called together. And at times, I've seen people with the three. And it's so rich, and I see it blessing them. But sometimes I see those who have no one else. And if you're of that group, I encourage you, please reach out. Talk to me. Pray for your person or your people. There's been times where a group of us have come together, and it's been spiritually rewarding and brought people to Christ and reached out like... We need that. If we don't have that, we just need to pursue it. It's Jesus' model. We're just following the model for community. And 70, it's not just about 12. It went from 12 to 70, 70 to 120, 120 to the crowds. 3,000 were saved at Pentecost from one sermon. So we don't think small, but we need to have the small elements in place. Otherwise, who's going to encourage us? Who's going to lift us up? Who's going to know us? You know, Ed, you came and you shared from your point of service. This is how I can serve the body. But we need to be serving you right now, brother. Your mother is sick. You're traveling. Like, you need a body of Christ around you. And if you're just the one who does the thing, then you're not in community. But you know there's us here who love you. So who's your three that you can call? Moment's notice. 11 o'clock at night, 2 in the morning, 10, whenever. You know, you need that. It's not just one close friend, but a band of brothers. And the 12, so when you're flying to Pennsylvania, there's someone bringing a meal to your house. Like that sort of community, that's how it's got to look, if it's going to look the way Jesus looked. And so I, as a pastor, love the 70, but I, I almost like the 70 like holds me back or something. The 70 is like a shortfall when we settle for the 70. So I have a couple of questions I'd like to ask us to divide into groups and discuss, and that's why, what, what I wanted to leave time for here at the end of the service. I would like us to just think about this, but before I do, I'll give you two perfect case studies just from this last week. One was a phone call that came in to me from a, a dear sister in Christ who's been coming to church here for a few years and just said, you know, Pastor, I wanted to let you know that I'm going to be moving on from New Hope when we're starting to attend another church down the road. And there's no problem. I really love what I've learned here. I've learned so much through the discipleship program, and I really learned so much through the sermons. And I just, I do love New Hope, but it just feels like it's time for me to move on, time for a change. I said, well, sister, you know, if there's anything that's wrong, we always want to fix things. We don't want to leave problems. She said, no, I assure you, it's not like that. I said, okay. Um, but she said, I just want you to know this church has really been pivotal. I know so much more about God's word now than I ever did. In conversations with my unsaved husband, like I, I know how to defend my faith or just talk about it. And it's made me more confident in raising our children. Like it's just, it's been so good. So I said, well, praise God. That is some role that we've had in your life. And our doors are always open. You know, come back and join us whenever, part of the extended family. So I hung up. And afterwards, this was like, you know, midweek. I'm preparing this sermon about community and relationship. And it just came back to me. It's like, this person said that what they got out of their time here was the things they learned. It wasn't community that they experienced. So I called her back. <laughs> I called her back. Said, Would you mind if I ask you just a couple of quick questions? It will help me learn as a pastor like how we relate to each other. Can I just ask you as I'm preaching the sermon? I gave her the overview, much briefer than I'm giving to you, sorry. Uh, 3, 12, 70. And I said, do you feel like you had a 3? Do you feel like you had a 12, you had a 70? And so her comment was, well, I think, well, the people I know best are probably like my seatmates, the people who sit around me in church, and we get to know each other. We sort of sit in the same places all the time. And I thought, okay. She found her three, her three was in the 70. It wasn't those. I said, well, did you ever have any, like, meals together in people's homes? And she said, no, I don't think I did. And so I'm feeling like, oh, <laughs> 
Uh, people come with different reasons, different expectations, but we need to be the kind of place that embraces community and fosters it. Right? Her community, she came to learn. Essentially, I was the professor and she was a student and she graduated. But the only thing we have here to offer that no other place does is this group of people. You, we, me, are the only thing different from the church down the road. So if someone's coming for a program, there's a better program up here. If someone's coming for a kids program, there's a better kids program over here. Someone, like, there's programs, but we're supposed to commit to people. We're not supposed to commit to programs. Jesus didn't commit to the program of healing. Hang up a shingle. Jesus, healing ministry, come and get it. No, Jesus picked three, and he said, we're going to go out and we're going to change the world because God is more powerful than any of the forces of evil that are out there. And he gathered his 12, and he said, let's go on mission. I will teach you everything I know. And then you teach everyone else everything I taught you. And 70, go, spread, take over. It's a kingdom. Win, right? So it's just an example of someone who enjoyed their time here but never really experienced that community. And I'd venture to say there's some of us in this room right here that feel the same way. But I said there was two examples. The second one, and man, I'm not good at being brief. I will try. Um, The second one was someone else this week who just with tears in their eyes came to me and said this Church family knows how to love. I was in such a low place this week, and instantly God rose up his people in this place, and I was overwhelmed, and I had not told anybody what I was going through. I'm like, ah, see, that's when it's working. That's when it's working because people knew each other. That person I know for a fact has three, and I know that person has 12. And that person's part of our 70. And that's when it's going to work. No one can know our heart if no one knows our heart. And we can do the 70. The minute you walk in the door, you're part of the 70. Praise God for all the visitors that just walk in. It's like instant 70, instant church. Jesus didn't stay with just the 70. And he didn't even start with the 70. And so I think in his order of priorities, you finding the three, all of us guys out there that are easier being on our own, We need to connect and form our bands of brothers. Women out there who are so busy with momming and working, multiple jobs, crazy hours, family commitments, you need each other. The busier you are, the more you need each other. And when you have a three, it's going to feel more manageable. Same life, it's going to feel more manageable because you are being built up in the Lord by sisters who know. And then guess what? When all those threes get together in a 12, it's like, woo, Holy Spirit's doing something here. It's easy to go on mission when you get 12 people that are on fire for God. Never mind the 50 here today. Never mind, you know, the 70, the church collected. That's my prayer for us as a church. My prayer for every single one of you. Nothing does my heart better than to see you connected with each other. And I need to be connected as well. I need my three. But sometimes in the traditional model of church, it's sort of like, 1 to 70 ratio, right? So then that feels frustrating for me and frustrating for everyone else too because I'm not dividable by that much. (laughs) Very teeny, teeny sliver. I got something for you six months from now for three minutes, right? That was how it would have to go, but I don't want that. I want to know and I want to be known and I want that for you. And so we have to come together in community. So it's just simply the question. I'm going to hand out this. We're going to take, say, 10 minutes or so and just think about what this looks like for us. And I wish we had hours more. There's so many great scriptures we could look in. But you know these. The point's been made. Let's just talk. Come together as some tens, five tens, whatever, and just think about what God's trying to say to you today about this.